every single time that I put any sort of call out on my Instagram for questions or I ask what people want to hear about from me, I am seeing the three same questions repeated again and again and again. And that's totally cool. That's fine. It just means these are clearly three things people really want to hear about. So I thought that I would just smush those three things together and answer them all for you in a video in a little bit more depth. Just for a bit of background for anyone who doesn't know, up until August 2020, I was a primate carer at a wildlife sanctuary in South Africa. If you want to learn more about that, the work that's done there, what it looked like being a primate carer, then I have a video about it. I'll leave that linked up at the top of this one and you can go check that out first. But in relation to this, the three questions I get time and time again are one, what did you study or what qualifications do you have? Two, how did you get your initial experience with wildlife? And three, how did you find your first staff position? Before I really delve into them, I just want to put out a reminder that everyone's career is going to look so different and you cannot take someone else's path and just sort of try and copy and paste that into your own life and think that's going to get you to the exact same place as them. Everyone functions differently, everyone learns differently, everyone has different things that are going to get them where they want to be in life. So don't worry if you've done things differently to me or to anyone else who's in a job that you want. You just have to find out what's going to work for you. Honestly, talking about studying is a weird subject for me sometimes because although I did pretty well in school and I always got, you know, pretty good grades and everything, I hated it. School was not a good time for me. <laughs> so in high school, I thought I wanted to be an actress. When it came time to leaving school, I didn't think that I had what it took to go to a drama school or anything. So I decided to get a degree and what I went to study was philosophy. The idea of like a gap year or an apprenticeship or anything wasn't really floated to me, so it wasn't something that I even considered an option. I just thought, go to university, get a degree. And philosophy was something that I was interested in. I enjoyed it in school. I did well in it. Within probably the first few weeks, I realized that this was not what I wanted. <laughs> And I remember pretty much everyone telling me the first year of university is difficult. You can't judge whether or not you actually like it from the first year. You need to at least complete the first year. So I did. And then I said, hey, I want to drop out. And they said, you can't tell from just the first year because the first year is always difficult. You have to at least complete the second year. And so I ended up feeling really pressured into doing the second year of my degree as well. I handed in all my paperwork to say I would not be back for my third year. And I took all of my savings at the time and I did some traveling. During that time I discovered what I really wanted to be doing with my life and that that was working with animals. At this point I thought specifically working with animals in a behavioral research sense and I realized if I want to go into research I need to have a degree <laughs> which honestly I would say is still true today. I think if you want to go into a very research-based position then you do need official qualifications. I don't know anyone personally at least who has gotten into that kind of position without a qualification. So I started thinking about my options and the difficulty for me came from the fact that at school I was not particularly good at maths or sciences. So I did not have, do not have, any maths or science qualifications above an intermediate two and I have no idea what that translates to in school this year but basically for the last two years of my high school education I didn't do any maths or science. This meant that now if I was to go through a UCAS application to get onto something like zoology, veterinary medicine, marine science, biology, something that would really really relate to animal behavior studies, I wouldn't get in. I would have to probably go and get those qualifications and then apply and there was a lot of things that put me off doing that. So instead I spoke to my university and thought hey so I know I've just dropped out <laughs> But what if I were to tell you I want to come back and transfer into the psychology program? Psychology at my university was a very good department, but it was all focused on human psychology. So it wasn't going to be exactly what I was looking for. But my reasoning was I can generally take human models and learn independently how they would apply in animal welfare settings. And also I will learn how to carry out studies, analyze data, do write-ups, um, read scientific papers, a bunch of really, really, really useful skills to get me started. Of course, it wasn't that simple. <laughs> it turns out I also didn't have qualifications for that because you needed a maths qualification. 
I spoke to so many different people from my university and went through so many different meetings because no one knew what to do with me or what a good course of action would be that might get me in the sort of course that I wanted to be in. Eventually I spoke to a really 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 helpful woman who gave me an offer that if I were to come back to the university they would want me to leave with something. So I had to finish the third year of my philosophy degree and in doing so gain a basic degree in philosophy. And then the compromise was while I was doing that they would let me take all the modules from first year psychology. If I did well and I managed to prove to them that despite not having the background I was able to do this course and thrive on this course then they would let me continue. Miraculously I managed to do that. I actually got straight A's that year and I got onto this little like listy thing of great students. That never happened again, I can tell you that much. Would I say that it was easy? Absolutely not. Um, in order to make it relevant and to give myself the relevant knowledge that I wanted, there was a lot of self-study involved. I often had to take what was taught in lectures and then go back and do my own research to figure out how it actually related to me or how I could be interested in it because I just wasn't that interested in human psychology, if I'm being completely honest. And that was difficult because none of the staff knew anything about animal behavior, they weren't really able to help me and anytime I had a project or a write-up I would do it related to animal behavior and then the people marking it or the people helping me with it wouldn't really know what to do with me. <laughs> So it was hard and I probably gave myself way more work than I needed to. But at the end, I did some really, really cool studies. I mean, at the basic level, when you do things, you know, such as conditioning in psychology, easily relates to animals. I did loads of great studies on operant and classical conditioning and animal welfare. And then when you get to the higher levels and you get more freedom of what you get to write about, I got to do a really cool piece on the cultural transmission of dialects in orca pods, which was amazing. I loved it and for my final year study I got to design, carry out, analyze, write up and provide recommendations for my own independent research project which was epic. I did it on whether or not conspecific aggression increases in a troop of captive Barbary macaques in relation to the current keeper-led feeding pattern that was being implemented. So in complete layman's terms whether or not the way these monkeys were being fed was leading to an increase of aggression within the troop and if so was that a natural level of aggression and is there something we should be doing to change the feeding pattern in order to give them a little bit more of a natural life and increase their overall welfare. So overall that is it. I have a honours degree in psychology and I have a designated basic three-year degree in philosophy and that's all the qualifications that I have. Now honestly I don't have any like mind-blowing secret to this. I volunteered. I think anyone who wants to work with wildlife is going to have to volunteer. I don't know anyone working with wildlife who never volunteered. I was in a super privileged situation. So I come from a pretty middle class background. While I was at university, I was having financial help for my rent and living costs. And also, as I was a Scottish student at a Scottish university, my tuition was free, so I didn't have to worry about paying university. Because of this, all of the work that I did throughout university, I was able to put, I would say, most of that away into savings. And that doesn't mean I didn't work hard. <laughs> because I knew this is what I wanted to do and I knew I needed to have a big bed of savings and that probably did work against me when it came to my studies and was a detriment to my studies but it's what I chose to do. But it does also mean that I had the support of my family that if I took a risk that didn't pay off or I found myself in a difficult situation financially I knew that I would have people willing to help me and that isn't the case for everyone. So I was very very lucky. I was able to take some risks with my money and I was able to save up and a lot of people who have to pay bills and living costs just can't do that. I think in this industry we really have to recognize our privilege and recognize there are a lot of barriers for people. But in my case, in my situation, what I did was I worked throughout the entire school year and then over summers I paid to volunteer. I personally do not believe that paying to volunteer is a bad thing if it is done correctly. So when I say done correctly, I mean you should be paying for your living costs and your food. They should always be included in whatever you are paying. You should not be paying for them on top of a fee and you're paying for the investment of the staff into your training. So you should be being trained in something really valuable. You should not just be learning nothing from your experience. You are paying to learn. And as someone who has been both a volunteer and someone training volunteers, I can tell you it takes 
a lot of investment to get someone who has never worked with wildlife to the point where you are comfortable not only leaving them alone with a wild animal, but ensuring that they are not gonna get themselves or someone else hurt in any task on site. And personally, I was in the situation where I was happy to pay to receive that training. I also want to really quickly say in terms of paying to volunteer that I have seen firsthand how difficult it is for a lot of wildlife sanctuaries to finance themselves. And that is a huge reason that the pay to volunteer scheme exists. When you're paying to volunteer, you should be making contribution directly to the sanctuaries running and you should be seeing how helpful that money is being and where it is going. On the other hand, you definitely get places that are not good sanctuaries that will take your money and allow you to participate in unethical practices that do not work towards the benefit of the animals, that do not train you properly or give you any sort of knowledge to leave with, and that are charging extortionate prices, usually through third party organizations. It can be so difficult to separate the two and that is definitely something I will do a video of in the future. I do know also plenty of people who I have met working with wildlife who have never paid to volunteer, that have volunteered for free, but I do not know anyone, like I said, who has not volunteered at all. I've also volunteered for free more recently and I just found it was a very different experience in terms of the relationship with the organization and what you can expect, but it was also very, very, very valuable. So there are different ways to go about this. This video is just about my personal experience. So while I was volunteering, probably about 50% of the time I was on very research-based volunteer sites and then the rest of the time I was doing more basic animal care. So that was anything from the food prep and enclosure cleaning all the way up to basic medical care and behavioral rehabilitation. I cannot tell you how much I learned but I also saw loads of people volunteering alongside me who I don't think learned anything at all and that wasn't because of the staff's lack of effort that's because when you do something like this you were going to take away from it what you are willing to put into it and I was willing every day to do more work go above and beyond push myself ask questions get involved you really really need to put your energy into it if you want to be taking something valuable out also throughout university, one of the many, many, many jobs I had was um, working with dogs. So I was doing dog walking and pet sitting and that just gave me hands-on experience with domestic animals, which is also very, very valuable if you want to start working with wildlife. I also did online courses and self-study and I actually put a video out last week about different ways to build up your CV from home with a sort of particular focus on wildlife work because that's what I know. <laughs> So um, I'll put that if you want to check it out and see how you can get started during lockdown. So in 2018, I was starting to think to myself, man, I'm going to be graduating soon. <laughs> and I'm someone who really likes to have a plan and I like to get things in motion as soon as possible. So I started thinking about what my next steps were going to be and how I was going to find a job. Now I was looking at job boards and websites and everything, but nothing that appealed to me or that I felt I was suited to was actually really coming up. So I decided to take matters into my own hands a little bit. What I did was towards the end of 2018, sort of early 2019, I was making a list of every sanctuary that I had heard of, either through word of mouth or through social media, and then looking at sanctuaries affiliated with them, accredited sanctuaries, and making a list of places that I thought looked interesting to work at. I then went through that list and I researched each place individually. I looked at what animals they care for, whether or not I thought they were ethically run, if they had any particular values that really aligned with me, and what their staff situation was like, if they took on staff or if they only took on volunteers, that kind of thing. And I wrote a list of ones that I was like, I should contact these. And even though I can't find anything particularly advertised that suits me, I'm gonna contact them and just see, maybe they have something that they haven't put up yet or that's coming up that they think I would be a good fit for. Now this very direct approach doesn't necessarily have the highest success rate, I will be honest. But what I did was I wrote personalized emails to each of these places and attached my CV. In those emails, I included who I am, what I want from my career, and why I thought that place in particular fit my specifications and what I thought I would have to offer them. From that, I must have emailed maybe 50 places and I got three positive responses. <laughs> One of them was for a job that I didn't feel like I was qualified for and I was basically just too scared to go for. Which I don't recommend, by the way. If someone contacts you saying, wow, you could actually be a really good fit for this job, just go for it. <laughs> if you don't get it, it's not the end of the world. But I turned it down because I just didn't have the confidence in myself to go for it at the time. Um, the second one was also for a job that I thought was interesting, but wasn't exactly what I wanted. 
So the third one is what I ended up going with, and that was from the Vervet Monkey Foundation. They came back and were basically like, hey, with your experience and your passion, we think this internship would be really great for you, which was a really great in. So in August 2019, I flew out to South Africa and I started as the integration intern. That was basically meant I was working with a team that was introducing monkeys into troops. So these were either orphans, expats, rescues that were currently living alone or maybe in a pair and needed to be introduced to a full troop and that process of how to make sure that they are accepted and they feel comfortable when they get a place in the troop. It was really, really interesting. I loved it, but I knew that what I was really going for was a staff position. I always had that in my head. So once I got there, I really worked my little booty off. <laughs> I tried to learn as much as I could about not just the job that I was interning in, but every job on site. I tried to make myself really useful, help out wherever I could, really chip in with other jobs and support other people, work with volunteers as well. I showed up every single day and gave my best every single day and it was exhausting and it was difficult, but it paid off because when there was an opening for a temporary primate carer, I put my name forwards and they were happy to take me on. And that really came from them knowing that that I was doing well in the sanctuary environment, that I was working hard, that I was dedicated not just to wildlife work but specifically to this sanctuary and like I said people need to know that you're going to be able to stick around and honestly I think I would have stayed at that sanctuary longer had situation been a little bit different but obviously coronavirus happened, things became very difficult and, and my visa was due to expire, there was no way I was going to be able to extend it from inside the country and yeah there were a lot of there were a lot of factors basically but in August 2020 I ended up coming home and I guess got a little bit stuck in the UK. So I am in discussions about potential future jobs, things that I will be going on to do, but I am not saying anything about that, particularly on social media, because nothing is certain right now. We all know that with the way the world is. I don't know exactly what's gonna happen and I'm not gonna announce something to have to take it back. I've done that once before, it was rubbish. <laughs> so basically, as soon as anything is confirmed, you'll know about it, but until then, you're just gonna have to trust me that I am not a one-hit wonder and I will be working again with wildlife hopefully very soon. So I hope that answered those three questions for you in enough depth. Like I said, everyone's journey will look different. You may not relate to my way of doing things. You may not find how I did things accessible. That is perfectly okay. I know accessibility is something we absolutely need to work on in this industry. And to be honest, I didn't know that when I was paying to volunteer, when I was doing all this stuff. It's something that in probably the past two, maybe three years, I've become so much more aware of. And if I would do things the same, honestly, I don't know. I don't know if I would, but that is what felt right to me at the time. It is how I got my experience. I don't regret it because I'm so happy with where I ended up. So if you have experiences with struggling in this field or finding that there doesn't feel like there's a place for you, let me know in the comments. I'd really like to hear other people's experiences and learn more about the experiences of people in this field so that while I move through my career, I can be keeping these kind of things in mind and seeing how in the future I can try and help implement some kind of change. But for now, like many of you, I am waiting out this pandemic to see what the next chapter of my life is going to look like. So thank you for joining me in this video. I will see you next week for episode five of my little lockdown series. Thank you so much for coming and getting through lockdown with me. It has been rough, but we are doing it. If there's anything you want me to cover while I'm stuck here in my room, please let me know.